so I'm going to go ahead and begin the webinar. I want to welcome everyone out there who we can't see to MBO Presents. I'm Pam Morton, the Executive Director of the National Basketry Organization. We're very excited to have you join us for NBO Presents 2022, how to photograph your work with NBO board members, Kale and Eric. Um, we have disabled the chat. It, it, it will only come to the panelists and me. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. I'll be monitoring the questions throughout the program. If they're answered, I'll just delete them and otherwise we'll try to get to as many of them as possible towards the end of the program. As you can imagine, these webinars have a financial impact on NBO and we do them for free. I've put the, I'll be putting the donation link in the Q&A section or you can go to nationalbasketry.org to the donate tab. We appreciate your donation of any amount. Your support is invaluable. And at this time, I'm going to hide myself and I'll be back about 10 minutes before the hour. So that'll be, give everybody sort of a visual warning that we're wrapping up and we'll move into whatever remaining questions there are. Thanks for joining us. See you later. Thanks, Pam. Um, so I'm gonna share a, a slideshow that uh, Kale and I have put together um, that will lead us through a number of different topics um, and uh, uh, you know, give you some visuals. Um, as, as you'll note, this uh, presentation is all being recorded. Um, so uh, you know, feel free to take screenshots if you want, but you also have access to it once we get it up to YouTube if you want to refer back to it. Uh, so just a brief introduction. Uh, my name is, uh, as Pam mentioned, my name is Eric Stark. Uh, I'm actually a, an architect and I teach architecture. I'm also a, a basket maker. Uh, I've been serving on the NBO board for the past year. Uh, and I look forward to uh, sharing some of the things we've learned about uh, photographing our work today with you. And my name is Cale Chapel. I'm also on the board and currently serving as vice president of National Basketry Organization. I'm a basket maker, uh, primarily weaving in waxed linen thread. And also I have a project, um, Baskets of Africa, where I work with African baskets. Great. Uh, so uh, as Pam said, if you do have questions as we're going through this, please do put them in the, the Q&A and we'll get to them eventually. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll answer some of your questions as we go through this. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Kale get started. All right. Well, the first question of, that should be answered is why do you need good photos? Um, and the number one reason that we're addressing here is for submitting to exhibitions. Uh, submitting to exhibitions such as uh, NBO's upcoming Every One 2022, which is an online exhibition for um, every member of the National Basketball Organization. And if you're not a member, you can still join and uh, become part of that exhibition. Um, but you want to, you know, put your best foot forward and have nice photos of your work. So when people see it on the Internet and when the jurors see it, it looks nice. Uh, NBO um, has another upcoming call for entry uh, called um, Art Evolved Intertwined, which is a joint show with SAQWA, the Studio Art Quilts Association. So we have a couple of submissions uh, or calls for entry coming up real quick here. Um, another might be if you're submitting your work to galleries uh, for posting on social media and just to have your work looking its best when you present it to anyone. Um, uh, so, uh, first off, let's just talk about a little bit about the difference between getting professional photos taken and your own personal work. Uh, it, it's sort of the fundamental place I think you want to start. Um, the question of should you hire a professional is, is really up to you. And I think it depends on the quality of work you're looking for um, and why you're using that work. Certainly, as I, I think anyone out there, whatever profession you happen to be in, understands that a professional certainly brings some skills to the table. Uh, a professional photographer is going to be a better photographer than you or I if we're not doing it professionally. Um, so how does that work? I would certainly suggest having worked with a professional photographer uh, for some of my work in the past is uh, find someone who's got good references, perhaps someone you know. Um, I think fundamental to that work is you want to find someone you're actually collaborating with. 
Um, the, the photographer that I use occasionally, um, I'm there during the photo sessions. So I can tweak the baskets. I mean, there are things I know about the work that the photographer doesn't. And obviously there are things about the photography that the photographer knows that I don't. So it really wants to be a collaboration. So I think first and foremost, you wanna find someone that you're comfortable collaborating with. Um, then you'll just bring them their work, bring the work to them. Um, I think if you're gonna do it and you're gonna pay for a session, uh, having multiple pieces, maybe stuff you've made recently or stuff in the past is always worth doing. Um, uh, and, and in that way, you're going to get a certain quality of picture. Um, but can you take your own photos? Of course you can. And that's what we're going to show you how to do today. I think you can take photos of a quality that are good for almost any situation. I know a number of calls, certainly some calls that I've entered. The initial photographs are ones I've taken for myself. And if I'm successful and I, I, I'm, I'm part of the exhibition, often it's, it's at that point that I'll actually take the time and spend the money to hire the professional if I'm looking for something above and beyond. But I think definitely your own photos um, can be used uh, in almost all situations, if not all situations, depending on the time and energy you put into them. And I think that's fundamental to understand is that in taking these pictures, it, it, it does take some time and effort. Um, it does take some thought, much like the, the thought you've put into your own work. Um, uh, so just, just keep that in mind. Um, part of the idea of that uh, that goes along with uh, hiring a professional is this idea of photo credit. Um, and that's really like any of us want credit for our work. So if you've got a photographer and you use that person's uh, photograph, you just, you know, under the photograph, it says photo by John Doe, Jane Doe, whoever it happens to be. The key thing I think with photo credit is you want to have this discussion with your photographer before you actually pay for anything. Because depending on the profession, depending on how the photos are being used, you don't always own the photograph. So I, I'll just use my own personal experience. As an architect, architectural photographers, they own the image. I just license the image from them. So I pay a fee if I want to use it online. I pay a different fee if it goes into a magazine. I pay a different fee if it's on my website. Um, that's not necessarily nor typically the situation when, you're, when someone's uh, taking pictures of your products, um, but you want to know that up front. You want to understand, and certainly I would suggest that you want to um, gain and own the, the image itself. And then you can do whatever you want. For some photographers, they might charge you a little bit more for that. But again, that's why you want to know up front um, if, if that plays into it. Some photographers, they'll take the picture, you've paid them, you can do whatever you want with the pictures. And that's you want that sort of freedom, I think, um, rather than licensing the pictures. So that's probably the one thing you definitely want to have that conversation with a professional before you get going. Um, now, a couple different kinds of pictures that we're going to talk about, the difference between editorial and product photos. Um, so editorial pictures are the kinds of stuff you'd see perhaps in a magazine. You'd certainly see them on social media. I'm going to show you a couple examples in a second, uh, but they're really about context. They're telling a story. Um, the product photos is all focused on the individual object, and it's really that that we use for exhibition submissions um, because you want the, the viewer to be focused purely on the work itself. Um, where the editor, editorial style photos you're going to use mostly, as I mentioned, in social media or when you're telling a, a, a different kind of story. Um, so quickly, I'll show a couple examples. I think here's a terrific example. Um, this is an editorial picture. This is actually a, a, a work uh, of Kale's. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's great for social media. I think right away in terms of telling its story, uh, you get this very clear sense of the Southwest. Uh, he's done a wonderful job in terms of the focus is still on the piece where the background is slightly out of focus, yet he has taken the time, um, and this, this doesn't just happen by accident, he's taken the time to consider that background. And I think that's key when you're taking uh, an editorial type photo, which is great for social media, um, uh, is, to, is to, again, think about what is in the background. It's still an image of your work. It's still something you're putting out there. It's going to be online for a long time. So you still want to consider it, uh, but you're telling more of a story. Um, that said, uh, that story, that background can sometimes be distracting, right? It certainly adds something to the picture, but when we get to exhibitions, it can be somewhat distracting. So here's an example of a product photo. It's straightforward. It showcases only the basket with no distractions. Um, and for exhibitions, this is, you want that focus on your work. Um, uh, you know, some exhibitions will allow you two or three photos. So maybe you're taking it from the top as this one was taken from the side. That's fine, but it's all the focus is here. And that's what you want for an exhibition photo. And that's what we're going to show you um, in a second. So I think the editorial photos, they're more like, as, it's, as it described, they're snapshots. 
Um, you know, again, consider the background, but the product photo, which is what you're going to want for exhibitions, it, it basically peels everything else away and focuses purely on that. Um, so how do you take uh, product photos uh, with a blank background? Um, we're going to show you that in a second. Some concerns. Do I need a fancy camera? No, you certainly can use one, uh, but you can do it nowadays. If you've got a, a, a decent phone, that's the way I shoot most of my stuff. The cameras in there are just are incredible. Um, do you need a lot of equipment? Again, no. Uh, we'll lead you through a couple of, uh, of how simple it is to do. Um, and at the end, um, in terms of software, Kale is going to give you a demonstration of an online app that you can use um, selectively. I think, as I'm sure he'll describe, you always want to take the best picture first. It's not something that you're going to want to fix in post-production, uh, but you don't need any of these things to take good photos. A decent camera, um, you're going to need some source of light and maybe some computer software to do some adjustments after the fact. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. All, all right. So uh, I was just going to add one thing on photo credits. Um, Basically, you have you need a photo credit to give credit to the person that took the photo, even if it's a family, a friend, maybe a gallery, a museum, whoever took that photo, you need to get their permission uh, for uh, to use that photo. And if we go back one slide there, sorry. Um, so make sure you have permission to use the photo before uh, you use it. <laughs> that's that's important. Um, this is a small professional type studio with probably somewhere close to 15, around $15,000 worth of equipment. You don't need this to get your photos for exhibition submissions. I actually find that I take worse photos in with all this equipment because whenever I go in there and try to use it, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, adjusting all the lights individually, all the cameras on the big fancy camera. And there's a, you see this orange cord that runs over to the desk. You actually control the camera from a computer. It's just too complicated. So often um, I get terrible photos using all of this equipment. This is for professionals to use, uh, not me or most basket makers. So here's an example of a photo that I took with a cell phone without any equipment at all. And that made it pretty easy. Um, we're going to get more into how exactly we did this, but uh, let's look at the next slide, which shows you this is the setup. <laughs> Instead of, you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment, all kinds of fancy stuff and complicated uh, things to use, I literally took a piece of butcher paper. I taped it to the wall over, uh, this is my bookkeeper's office because she has a window. Um, put it over her desk. There's a window, you see a window kind of to the left of the image, but it's mostly blocked out. There's a little bit of sun that comes through that, but above that, there's another window that has filtered light coming in from the left-hand side uh, of this setup. And I just use some of that blue tape that you use for painting that comes off easily so you don't uh, mess up your wall. And um, it's coming straight from the wall and then curving down to the flat surface of the desk so that it, it makes a cove. Making this cove, you don't have, if you use two pieces of paper, one flat on the wall and one flat on the table, you would have a horizon line that then you'd be trying to work to try to get rid of that horizon line. By making it just curve into a cove, you don't have a horizon line, so you can uh, have a really good picture to start with. The next. Uh, so the white is the best and preferable because, again, what you want to do is show off your work. Your work is the basket or the object. You don't want to show off the background and have distractions for the jurors or the gallery owners or whoever it is that's looking at your work and even on social media. Um, now, if you don't have the ability to do butcher paper or... Um, uh, you know, something white or, or a neutral gray also works. Or maybe you want to, you have a light colored basket and you want to shoot it on black. Well, you'd probably go to the store and get some craft paper and make that cove. Um, so you never want a cluttered background. Um, you could find the most plain and blank space in your house where your baskets fit. Here, I just cleared off a bookshelf 
um, and took the picture inside the bookshelf with uh, this one. Actually, the light was behind me because the window happened to be behind me and it was it was actually enclosed inside a bookshelf. So no light could come in from the sides, but it's a pretty basic, simple background that would look better than if you took it on your kitchen table with your kitchen behind it or you know in the living in the living room with your tv and things like that behind it this is this is less distracting to the eye and your eye pretty quickly focuses right there on the basket um, uh, we have a question about shadows okay um i'll show you a little bit more on shadows they could be good or bad it, it, that's kind of up to personal preference um We'll, we'll look at we'll look at this a little bit more and i'm going to turn it over to eric uh, right now to talk more about the lighting yeah we'll touch on this a little bit so i think fun, one of the fundamental choices and, and kl already talked about sort of natural lighting um is natural versus what i would call manufactured it's sometimes called artificial i don't really like that term because it's not artificial it's real light it's just man-made light versus the sunlight um so uh so i use the term manufactured so I think the easiest thing, certainly again, because it's it's out there and it's free, um, is to set up near a window as Kale described in his previous uh, slides when he was taking pictures of that rose basket. Um, I think, you know, you get a nice filtered light, you want it to come from the side. In terms of the question of shadows, again, it is a personal preference, but in general, um, unless there's a real desire for uh, you to have that contrast where you, you know, in a, in a sort of sharp shadow, um, I would certainly suggest that you don't use direct sunlight, that you want it to be filtered. And I think certainly in an ex exhibit, that's what they're looking for as well. Um, once you start getting into the sharp shadows, um, it really becomes the, the, the photograph itself starts to become more important than the piece. Uh, you want it to be as straightforward as possible. So you really want the light to be diffused, filtered through a window is great. Um, if, you know, if, it, if you need something in front, you can put a lightweight, some sort of fabric or something in front of it, but you just want sort of a general filtered light. So I would certainly, um, and you'll notice, you can see in, in a cup, the third bullet here says experiment. I think that's the key to any of this, right? Is try it with, with greater shadows if you wanna see that. Try it with a different angle of light. Try it with a different background. I think you're gonna, just in the same way, I'm sure all of us have learned through the act of making, uh, when you're actually making your baskets, um, the same thing is true with the photography. You're not going to get it right the first time. So give yourself a few hours to experiment, to try different things. I think what you do want to avoid certainly is uh, something that's too dim. If you've got a really dark day, it's not going to be great for shooting. Uh, you're not going to get that filtered light. So it's not the best day to, to, to even experiment. Um, uh, so if you can figure out that window and a, and a place to set up uh, and then give it a bunch of different tries, I think you're going to you know, get the best results. That said, if you don't have a window or you wanted to do something with a little bit more technology, you can, and you wanted to use manufactured lighting, you can use a light box. And here's just a couple quick images. Um, you can find these things all over Amazon. They range in price from $30 to $250. Um, the ones you see here fold up, they're easy to put away, and they come with lights already built in. Uh, so you can see on the image of the left, a couple cords. It's gonna be some broad spectrum LED. It's gonna give you no shadow almost. It's gonna just sort of fill the box full of light. Um, again, as we've shown, and we're trying, we're not trying to spend your money. As Kale showed, I think so well, you can do this with a piece of butcher paper and get a decent photograph. Um, this is just another way, if you want a different kind of light, if you wanna be able to shoot at 20, any time during the day, um, this is a fairly inexpensive way to be able to shoot those photographs. And again, most of them, if not all, fold up so you can put them away. You don't have to keep this stuff out. There's a lot of YouTube uh, tutorials on specifically how to do this better, um, but certainly from what you see here, and I think in general, you can see one reason I grabbed these two pictures is the one on the left just shows that uh, camera on, uh, using a tripod. I think oftentimes, although cameras are very fast these days, if there is an issue, sometimes it's just your hand shakes and you have to take an extra photo. Um, a, Tripods of this scale are, are relatively inexpensive. Again, you might want to spend some money there, even if you are taking a photograph uh, just on a piece of butcher paper. Um, I probably would spend a little money there before I'd spend it on a light box. Um, I happen to have a light box. Um, depending on the size of your work, uh, you know, they can get pretty large pretty quickly. Um, so it's something that you just need to judge, but certainly another option, sort of a middle ground between the full-blown professional setup um, and just doing it with a window. 
Um, the cell phone itself as a camera, um, I think is, is an amazing tool. I mean, obviously they've come leaps and bounds and depending on how old your phone is, um, it, chances are it's got a, a great camera already on it. Uh, of course, if you've got a better camera, you can use that as well. Some quick tips in terms of how to use it. First and foremost, make sure that camera lens is clean. It's in your pocket, you've put your finger on it, you'd be surprised what shows up in those photographs. So just take a second and wipe that off. Um, secondly, get close to the basket. Again, it's not, when you're taking a product photo, it's not about the background. So you wanna get in there as close as you can, as long as your focus is still good. Uh, you certainly can, if, you, you know, if you're out a little bit and have too much white around it, you can always edit that, crop it later. Uh, but if you can get in closer, you're gonna get a greater level of detail, which allows you to use the photograph in multiple ways. Some of which Kale will show at the end of the presentation today. Um, just, you know, as you're taking, for those who are from, I know some of you are very familiar with shooting with your camera, uh, with your phone, some are not. Probably the most important trick I would suggest is when you're, when you're taking a picture with your phone, and I, I don't know that this will show up, but when you click on the screen, there's a little yellow box. Uh, you can't really see it, um, but there's a little yellow box that pops up. Um, and that just tells the camera, tells your phone what to focus on. And at least on the iPhone, if you scroll up and down, it adjusts the light level. I would certainly experiment with that as well. Uh, the phone does a great job in terms of sort of picking the correct light level for you. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly something in terms of getting the focus right and adjusting the light level, easy to do. The final one is, you know, take a picture from an attractive angle. Uh, keep the lens uh, about level with your work. But I think the key thing here, again, is it's underlined is experiment. Digital photos are cheap. Don't take two, take 30, right? You can, you, you will see them differently. I guarantee this. You will see them differently when you're flipping through them than when you're actually taking the picture. So take an extra, take pictures that you don't even think you'll use just to see it from a different point of view. And then as you flip through those, D delete the ones that aren't any good, keep the ones that are good. And you're going to find, you know, as you do that more and more, you're going to start realizing there are different ways uh, that you like to shoot, different ways that you think your work, everyone's work is different. What's the best way to show your work? So as long as you've got it set up, take more photos than you could ever use, and then take an hour or so and go through them. And, you know, if you start with fifth, start with 30, you know, whittle it down to two. But as you can imagine, you have a better chance of getting one good photo if you've taken 30 than if you've taken one, right? It just makes, the numbers just make sense. So go ahead and experiment, get a bunch of photos and don't worry so much as you're taking them, are they perfect? By all means, look through the lens, take your time, get it right, but you're gonna look at them again and that's when you're gonna decide what's the best one that you actually want to use. All right, so, um... After you have chosen your the best of the best photos that you've taken, um, you might still want to do a little bit of what's called post processing. Um, the, you, you, this is after you've created and made your photo, uh, chosen the best one. Post processing would refer to using uh, some software to maybe clean it up a little bit, maybe lighten it. Um, darken it, whatever you need to do to make it look the most like the actual basket looks. Um, so can't stress enough, there's no substitute for taking a good photo first. Uh, always take a good photo, T spend the time, make the effort, to take a good photo. Software can only fix so much and software can also be complicated and confusing, kind of like all that professional photo equipment. So the less you have to use the software, the better, and the better result you'll get um, in your final photo as well. Um, I'll just restress, Eric already said this, but when you're taking your photo and you touch the screen to show it where you want it to focus on your, on your basket or your, or your piece, the camera then readjusts the entire composition and the light levels so that it focuses best on that point. And that is really important. And if it still looks too dark, then you slide up uh, to, to, to brighten it, to increase the exposure, uh, or you slide it down if it's too bright to decrease the exposure to start with that good photo. Um, again, no substitute for a good photo. <laughs> but uh, once you have your good photo, Snapseed is a free um, photo editing software that works on Android and Apple devices uh, being cell phones and um, tablets. 
Uh, apparently, it also works on Windows computers, but I believe there is a charge for it if you use it on a computer, and I don't believe it's available for the Mac computer, but you can do it on your iPad, you can do it on your ta any tablet or phone, and you download it from the App Store, or I think it's called the Google Play Store for Android. Um, download it for free. Great. So I'll, you want to share that now? Uh, hit the next slide if you could. Oh, there we go. That's right. Um, so I, before I open Snapseed here, and I'll be sharing it from an iPad, um, before I uh, do that, I want to let you know there's a ton of different tools in Snapseed, a ton of, I mean, a thousand different ways you can modify your photo. So you can experiment and have fun and you're not gonna ruin your photo. You can always revert back to the original. Um, you don't have to save any of the changes, but you can try all different sorts of things, more than what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you just the basics today. But when you're doing this, you wanna, the most important thing is you wanna be careful not to over process your images. When you over process an image, like you put too much saturation, so there's too much red or too much blue, they, they look fake. They don't look real anymore. They don't look like your basket. Um, and if you, as you're using it, if you have your actual basket sitting, you know, on the table next to you and the software uh, up on your iPad or phone, you can look, you know, compare the screen to the, to the actual object to make sure that you're representing it properly and that you don't do too much to the photo. Uh, less is more. Start with a good photo and do the least amount possible to it in the, in the software to make it look good. Um, so I'm gonna show the three most important features, I think. Uh, rotate, because often, especially if you're shooting handheld, you know, you're just holding the phone in your hands, you might be off by a couple of degrees. It's not straight. So you want to rotate it and you want to do it in this order too. Then you want to crop it after you've rotated. I'll show you why. Um, and then they have a feature in there, a tool called Tune Image. I'll show you that. Then there's some more advanced options. Um, one called Healing, one called Lens Blur, and one called Brush Tools, uh, which I'll also show. And now I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my iPad. And this will take a moment for it to switch over. Okay. And when I open Snapseed, let's see here. Down on the bottom right, you'll see this little thing that looks like a plant, a plant leaf. That's the Snapseed logo. So that's the that's the app. I open that up and um, it's a blank screen. Um, and it says right there what to do, tap anywhere to open a photo. So I'm just gonna hit the plus in the middle. Now, because I'm on an iPad, there's no cursor. So I can't point at things. So I'm gonna awkwardly describe everything I'm doing. But I just encourage you to download this and play with it and look at these features first that I'm gonna show you. And then you can play with more after that. But um, I'm going to have to describe exactly what I'm pointing at because you can't see it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to open from device uh, up in the left here. There's also a camera where you can take the picture from inside Snapseed. But for whatever reason, I found it better to just take them on my phone and then open from device. When you go to open from device, uh, it's going to show you your camera roll from your phone or your tablet. Um, and what I want to do is select first this one that I took with the butcher paper. And you can see right off the bat, um, well, a couple of things. I probably should have used a little bit lower angle. I probably should have turned it a little bit more so I could see inside the basket at the rim because it's interesting inside there. Um, so I didn't pick a great angle, but that's why you take a bunch of photos like Eric was saying, because when you go back late from a bunch of different angles, move around, go higher, go lower, you know, try different settings. And then when you pick your best one, as you're flipping through your camera roll, you'll see that one like, oh, that's the one. So pick a good one to start with better than what I did here. But I can see it's also not vertical. 
the the bottom of the basket has vertical uh, walls and it's leaning to the left. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do is go to rotate. So um, over here on the right, there's a whole bunch of different automatic filters and automatic tools. Most of them will make your picture look worse. <laughs> they don't. They often don't make your picture look better. See, this one's oversaturated. It's too much red, too much green. Um, so I advise that you don't um, usually use any of these. So I'm going to go back to the very top option, which is current. Um, current is going to show me without any of that stuff that I just clicked on. Um, now, uh, okay, so I'm going to hit the X and close that um, and hit this little um, pencil in the middle to the right. There's a little pencil that's for editing. So I click on edit and it brings up all of these tools and it's a little over, it looks overwhelming, but that's because you don't need most of these. Um, or you can take hundreds of hours later to play with them all, but I want to just show you the most important ones. So the most, the first one that I mentioned is rotate. And in the second row of icons at the top and the second column is rotate. And it looks like a little arrow going around chasing itself. It's really simple here. Once I'm on this screen, I can touch the screen with my finger and slide whichever direction I want to go. And you can see that blue line at the top and the, and the angle that I'm moving it at. Now, um, the reason you want to rotate before you crop is because part of your picture will disappear as you rotate. Um, and you can see it in a very light gray box outside of the white box that that's the part of the picture that's going to be cropped out and gone. So um, I want to try to get it, get those vertical sides of the basket you know, sort of as vertical as I can. I'm just eyeballing it here. But that looks more vertical than it was before. And I moved it. I can see in the top left, I moved it uh, 2.81 degrees. But it looks a lot better because now it's straight. Uh, and I can either, at the bottom left, I can hit X. If I don't like what happened, I can hit X and go back to the tools. Or I can hit the check mark and lock it in. Uh, when I lock it in, I'm still not messing up the original, but I'm locking it in so I can go to the next step, which is crop. I can also, if I want, I can hit this uh, flip button. If I think, oh, it looks better pointed to the left, I'll hit the flip button and now it's pointed to the left. Uh, when I did that, it looks now maybe not quite as straight as I want it. So I'm gonna just adjust it a little bit more to get it as vertical as I can. And that's pretty good. So I hit the checkbox. Uh, I've kind of locked that step in so I can go to the next step, which is to crop. So I'm going to go back to the pencil in the middle on the right. And then in the first column, the second row, so right next to rotate, to the left of rotate, is crop. And it has these two sort of right angles pushing in on each other. Um, I click on crop, and I can select you know, however I want to crop it. I suggest you use one of these. Um, I like Square because, uh, honestly, because Instagram likes Square. <laughs> so I usually try to crop Square. But if your work is horizontal and low, like a low oval horizontal basket, for example, then you probably don't want to crop Square. Um, so you can choose, though, to use one of the normal expected aspect ratios, um, which is a good way to go. And But for me, I'm going to go with Square. Now I can take the corner. There's still a lot of white space around the basket. Um, so I want to bring it in tighter and it's automatically going to stay square no matter what I do with my fingers because I so selected square. Uh, I'm going to bring it in pretty tight to the bottom. I'm going to bring it in, you know, pretty tight to the top. Uh, now it's a little bit off center. So I just click with my finger and drag the box to get it, you know, about in the center. I guess that's pretty good. Um, and again, if I choose like, oh, wow, I really messed everything up, I can hit the X now and go back a step and not lock in this step. But I'm going to go ahead and hit the checkbox because I think that looks pretty good. And um, now it shows me where I stand now um, in, this, in this whole process. Uh, the next thing I want to do is tune the image. 
So when I come to the, the pencil on the right in the middle, the tune image is right at the top left. And for whatever reason, these tools are not in alphabetical order. Maybe they're in order of importance according to the developer. I don't know, but tune image, they put right on the top left. So I'm gonna click on tune image. And uh, what I'm gonna do now is down the bottom of the screen, there's an auto adjust and there's an adjust. Now, when I hit auto adjust, generally it's always gonna make the picture look worse in my opinion. Um, and up at the top right, there's a little box with a vertical line through it. If I click on that, it shows me what it looked like before. And then I lift off and this is what it looks like after. This is how it auto adjusted and said, hey, this is what we think you should do. Well, I think it looked better before like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the X, hit the pencil again and go back to tune image. And then I'm going to hit the manual adjust. Now, it's a little hard to see on Zoom here. That's why we're doing a direct live screen share from the iPad to try to get the best image quality. But the background of the uh, on this basket is a bit gray. It's a light gray. It's not white. So when I come in here, um, I want to adjust my brightness. Now, when I select brightness, now I can just drag my finger. And what I often like to do, I drag it all the way to the right. Wow, that looks terrible. What happens if I drag it all the way to the left? That looks terrible. Okay, so now, but then you can see what the tool does when you drag back and forth. Here's what the tool does. Now I want to go in and fine tune and just lighten it up a little bit. This is going to lighten the entire image, including the background, making the background a little whiter. And it's hard to tell if it's on true, true white or not, especially because it's completely surrounded by gray. It's hard for your eye to perceive whether this is true white or not. But I'm gonna go in and adjust, and I'm down here uh, in the list, there's something called highlights. And when I go to highlights, what it's gonna do is only brighten or darken the highlights. Now the highlights are the background for the in this picture because it's, it's very light in the background. So I can lighten the background further and again, if I go all the way to the right, that's what it looks like. It looks like it, it made too much of a change on the, the flower part. If I go all the way to the left, you see how it goes back to gray and it's too dark. So again, I'm just gonna bump it up a little bit and that's probably enough to push that background to white. Um, if I hate what I did, I can hit X and not save any of it. If I wanna see what it looked like before and after, you see it's a, it's a subtle difference. This is the after, and this is the before by clicking on that upper right-hand corner, the square with the vertical line through it. I think it's improved with the after, and the background is whiter. Here was the before. You can see now, wow, that was pretty gray. After, that's pretty white. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the check mark on the bottom right-hand corner and lock that in. Uh, now I'll just show you again here, if you hit the rainbow, on the upper right, it brings up all these things that we really probably never want to use. So I'm going to hit it again and get rid of it. That's a pretty good picture right there. Um, shadow or no shadow? There's a shadow there and it's kind of an ugly yellow color, the shadow. I would like to reduce that shadow and not have so much shadow. Um, but it doesn't really, your eye is still totally focused on the basket. It's still, this is, you know, would be, I would say, acceptable to put into an exhibition uh, call for entry. But if we go to some of the more advanced things now, um, let's show you, okay. I wanna jump to a different image, but I also wanna finish this image. So here's what I'm gonna do. Down in the bottom right, there's a, uh, share button, the box with the arrow going up, that's a share button. You're probably familiar with it from your phone. There are several options here in share. If you hit the top one to share, you know, you can put it in a text, an email, you can share it to Facebook, whatever you would like. Open in, I found that not useful. Save will save with changes that you can undo, but you're still modifying the original image. I like save a copy. I wanna keep my original photo. I don't wanna mess up my original photo. So I like to save a copy. 
If you export, it'll create a copy with the permanent changes. So I'm gonna just save a copy so I can um, have my original end this copy. Now it's saved. So now if I go back to open on the top left, click on that, oops. And open from device. There it is, but you can see my originals because I remember I ro rotated it to the left or I flipped the image so it's pointed left. The original is still in here, but I also have this modified version. Now to show the next thing, um, I'm going to pull up this image on the bookshelf. Hey, can I interject one thing? One thing yes. I just want to emphasize something um, that I think uh, uh, that one wants to consider as you get into this, as you start saving copies, which I totally agree with, keep try and keep organized. It's very easy to get unorganized with all your photos. So it's worth taking a little extra time, having folders set up. Uh, what are the good images? What are the best images? If you think about that ahead of time as you're making the photos, it's just going to make your life easier later when you're looking for something. So just from the very beginning, think of some sort of file structure. Uh, you know, maybe if you do different types, all your white oak baskets are in one place, all your, you know, knotted baskets or something else, whatever that happens to be. But it's worth thinking early on before the number of images, because as I said, you can take infinite images, um, why it's worth deleting the ones that are really bad. But if you're holding on to a lot of stuff, some sort of organization early on is going to help you in the long run. Thanks. Yeah, because when it comes time to make that submission on a call for entry and you have 50 shots of the same basket and you can't remember which one you had chosen is the best one best to name it some way or move it into a different folder or put a favorite on it or something. And you can do that in Snapseed here too. You can save it to a specific folder or portfolio or whatever, but I'm just saving it back to the camera roll for now, the regular roll. So here, you know, we look at this image, we would still want to go through the first steps. We would rotate it to the left a little bit. We would crop it. I would go square. We would tune the image um, to get it uh, as close as we can to uh, whatever brightness and contrast we want. But then there's another tool here I was going to show. I'm clicking on the pencil to the right in the center, which is called healing. Healing is, it's, it can be good and bad. <laughs> so healing is um, on the third row in the third column. And it looks like two band-aids crossing each other. So I'm going to click on healing. And what healing does is it tries to fix issues. So in this picture, maybe we have an issue with these holes on the right. That would be cropped out normally. But let's just say we have an issue with these holes on the right. Once I'm in healing, which I am now, I'm just going to take my finger and come down here. It makes a red line to show where my finger is touching over those holes. Now it's going to guess and, re and it basically it's kind of blurring and taking some, some of the image from around those holes and it's guessing at what I want it to do and it's, and it's uh, removing the holes. Let's see how it does with removing um, this horizon line. I don't know. Yeah, that's, you know, it mostly blurred it. Now there, I just took a chunk out of the side of the basket because I got too close. Now in this tool, you'll see an undo and redo at the bottom. So on the bottom left under undo, I can undo that last stroke of my finger. Some of the tools have an undo and redo. Some of the tools you just have to X out and then come back in. I don't know why. So I'm gonna come in from this side so I can get close to the basket, but not too close. And it sort of does an acceptable job of cleaning that up. Um, now, what say we wanted to take the tip of this leaf off on the right uh, below the red part of the flower. If I try to come in here and say, oh no, I don't want that tip of the leaf. It does some crazy weird stuff because it doesn't really <laughs> know what's going on here. So um, you can use it to remove a few things from a background and you'll see, you know, it just kind of blurred it and made it kind of weird looking, but by the time, say, you post this on social media or something, it might uh, be acceptable. Uh, personally, I try to take a good picture, so I never have to do that. Um, I'm going to hit the X here. Um, and I'm actually going to close that. I'm going to go to the top left corner and hit open. And I'm going to open from my device to get to my camera roll. 
And I'm going to open the, that image that we were working on before. And I'm going to go to, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to select a different image. I'm going to select an image um, that is really terrible. This is an example like of something you don't want to do. There's all kinds of stuff. Just It's just a mess, this image. But say you have an image that's not this bad, but you have some things in the background that you want to blur and focus the attention on your, this would be a good social media thing too. You want to focus more on the basket and not all of this other stuff. Uh, when I go to the pencil on the, on the right in the center, there's something called lens blur. So uh, almost down in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, one row up from there on the right-hand column, there's something called lens blur, it's a circle. I can click that and what this will do is it'll blur the background for you and keep the center in focus. And you can actually take your focus point and move it to where you want to go with your finger. And you can move your fingers apart and twist to kind of surround your, your, your basket or your object to get it as close as possible. Oops, I don't want to do that. Uh, get it as close to possible to just only being on your item. Oh, I did it again. Okay. Move this up. Okay. So um, now we can see this was the before where uh, everything's in focus. This is the after where the outside is blurred. We can also click on adjust down here on the bottom uh, in the center. And we can go to the transition width. That's this uh, center bit here. And you can make that transition lesser or more, depending on what your desired effect is. Now, when we look at it before, where everything was in focus, after, you know, it, you, can, you can kind of get a, a bit more focus on the basket, but you should never submit to an exhibition or gallery or something like that, starting with an image like this. <laughs> this is the worst. I looked around my where, my shop and I looked at where's the worst possible place I could take a picture and this was it. But that lens blur can be useful sometimes. Say you're taking a picture of a flower and you want the flower in focus, but everything else blurred and your camera put everything in focus, you know, you can use this trick for that. I'm gonna hit the X because uh, I don't uh, like that very much, but then the last thing is incredibly powerful. I'm opening for my device again. Uh, we'll go back to this image here. This is an incredibly powerful tool that you should really experiment with. I'm going to all of the tools on that pencil and on the third row, the second column, there's a brush, like a paintbrush. Uh, this paintbrush, does a number of things. One thing that I really like with the paintbrush is I'll go to exposure and increase the exposure all the way up to one. So this is gonna lighten anything that I draw on. And the shadow that's kind of an ugly yellowish color, I'm just gonna draw on it with my finger and it's lightening it. But what it's doing is it's actually lightening it, lightening it to a point where it's gone and now it's white. That is less distracting, I think, and looks better. Um, again, it's a matter of personal preference, but I, I think that looks better. And it was very easy to just erase it uh, when you're going to white. Down underneath the basket, I can see also there's some a little bit of darkness down there. I'm just going to go around there as well. Um, now, when I click up in the top right at the box with the vertical line, I can see what it looked like before. And you see that kind of ugly yellowish shadow and what it looks like and directly underneath the base of the basket too. And then I'll take my finger off. This is what it looks like after. When you look at this picture, the only thing you see is my work, my weaving. And that's what you want to show to the jurors and the galleries. And uh, sometimes on social media, you want to just show that. You just want to show your work. Sometimes you want to do an editorial photo with all your, with all of your, um, to show it, to tell a story. You can also, you know, pinch and zoom and look in and um, see if you made any errors on your, <laughs> your weaving. 
but this is incredibly, incredibly powerful. So um, we've got about 10 more minutes. All right. Yeah, I'm wrapping it up here so we can get to um, so we can get to questions. Effect. Um, thank you very much, Eric, because I might have just kept talking forever. Effect. There's these other things that are also very useful. Saturation. Uh, saturation is showing a plus 10. I can just apply saturation to certain areas of the basket, say this light green band, and it's gonna saturate the colors only in that area. Now, in this case, I'm making this picture worse, but I wanted to show how this works. You can also decrease the saturation and I could take one area of the basket, say the leaf, and I'm basically taking the color out of it and it's turning to black and white. So um, that is a useful tool and you can also do it um, to a lesser degree. Effect over here on the left where it says effect, that's how I'm getting this menu to pop up. Uh, temperature, you say you have your photo, but you know, it's just, it needs a little more um, yellow in it, a little hotter. Well, you can add that. Uh, say you need it to be a little cooler down here. Cooler is going to, it's going to add more blue, but only in the places where you're telling it to. So that, that can be very useful. And likewise with exposure. And again, I'm destroying this. I know, but I'm doing this for effect. Say the exposure, say it's too light somewhere on your photo and you want to darken it, or it's too dark and you want to lighten it. This is pretty extreme, um, so you'd want to do the probably the point three, not the not the one like it was. But I'm just trying to show you what it looks like. So if you have a shadow and you want to try to lighten it a little bit or darken it a little bit, you can do that. Now this looks terrible, so I'm just going to hit the X. Um, and I'm and when I hit that X, I lost the the shadow fix. So it works well to do this in stages too. You know, once you fix your shadow, save it then you could go back in again with the same tool and try to do something else. And if it doesn't look good, you know, don't save it. Um, that's about all I have. There's um, we have, settings, we've got a, tutorials. We've got, a few, we've got a few questions in here so we can go to those. I think that's great. I mean, I think the key thing there is, as you see uh, Kale going through it is feel free to experiment. You're not going to break anything. Um, I think all too often we think something bad's going to happen. Feel free to experiment, uh, save different versions, um, because oftentimes the, the changes are subtle. I really appreciate as Kale's flipping back and forth between images. He's, uh, you know, he's adjusted in images, the, the, the original image, because I think sometimes that's when you'll really see the difference. Are there any questions about how to do something in Snapseed, or should I stop sharing Snapseed? Uh, it looks like... Um, Let's see, I'm just looking through the questions. I'm not sure there's anything specific to Snapsy yeah. versus um, just talks about light about questions. Light. Yeah, light and something with the iPhone. So I think we're yeah. okay. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing then. All right, I hope that gave a pretty good overview. But again, like Eric said, play around with it, try it and um, it's free. You have lots of photos, the photos are free. Just don't mess up your photos. Save a copy and you're good to go. Save a copy. Um, in terms you of always have your original. Yeah. In terms of some of the questions, I think if lights aren't built into your light box, I find the broad spectrum LEDs are, are really good. I think the key is how big is your box? Um, I've certainly found strip lights are much better than, say, a bulb. Um, because it sort of fills the whole box and oftentimes, but you certainly, I would argue the key thing is having more than one light source, even the broad spectrum LED, which tends to not have shadows. I'd always have two strips or two or three bulbs. You just want to flood it with light. You, again, in general, you're not trying to create shadows. You can always turn those bulbs off and create shadows if that's what you're after to, to the question about shadows earlier. Um, but I think you just want multiple sources um, and the LEDs are great just because they're low energy. They, they give off no heat. Um, and they tend to, depending on which ones you buy, give you a very natural light. So you definitely want to look at the, um, uh, the quality, the, the, uh, the heat temperature of those bulbs to make sure you're getting the light quality that you want. Uh, let's see, um, bracketing. Okay, we answered. Uh, uh, there's a question if, 
If you're, how do you control your shaky hand when not using a tripod? Um, the best answer is use a tripod. Um, my hands are shaky too. Um, they just tend to do that. You can get a small tripod for your phone for 10 bucks for nothing. I, I guess you could try and brace it, but I, ju I just find it's just not helpful. It's just so easy when I set it up with that tripod. The nice thing about having the tripod, uh, this is uh, Paula's question to Paula, is that uh, once it's in place, it doesn't move. So if I want to take subtle changes in that picture, I can do it. In my hand, it's much harder to do that. Um, so I would strongly suggest just investing in an inexpensive tripod. There's so much stuff out there um, just because it immediately gets rid of that handshake. You just don't have to worry about it. Um, I can else? answer the question about the bracketing there. Bracketing is when you change um, exposures up and down. So when you take a photo, like you can set, if you have a big uh, digital SLR, big camera, you can bracket where you hit the you hit the button once and it'll take like seven photos, three above exposure, three below exposure and one at exposure. So then you have seven to choose from. So you have all the different light sources. So it's not really bracketing on the phone when you slide up and down, but it is basically just brightness, uh, making it brighter or, or less bright. But you can kind of get the effect of bracketing by doing it really bright, you know, and then kind of doing different versions of it. Um, but it's not true bracketing. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? What about the one from Bev? Sizing? Yeah, point. there's a cut. There's one about sizing and then the one from Nolan also, because they're both about sizing and quality. So sizing and quality, it depends on where you're sending it. Like if you want to put it on social media, I find, you know, about 1200 pixels wide at 72 dots per inch is plenty. Sometimes I don't want to put it too large on social media, like my earrings, for example. You don't really want people to see earrings this size and look at all the errors. You can see the threads coming off of the thread and, you know, you want them to see it small. So you don't really want them to zoom in on it. You might want to just upload a very small photo. Uh, so it kind of depends on there's a lot of there are a lot of factors um, now for higher resolutions. A lot of the submissions might ask for 150 DPI, 300 DPI. 300 DPI would be for print, like if it's going to magazine or if you want to print a poster. Um, you can make minor adjustments in Snapseed on sizing, but basically if you, if you save it, the default on Snapseed is to save it at 95% quality full size. So in Snapseed, that's generally going to give you a uh, high enough quality to submit to any exhibition. And with a modern phone, like within the last two, three years, you notice with phones, when you buy, they're always talking about, oh, we have the better camera. We have the better camera. All the marketing is on the cameras these days right. because the cameras are keep getting better and better and better. So if you have a phone that's from the last three years or so, take the picture, export it, or save it as a copy from Snapseed, that's going to be big enough to put in any exhibit and probably even big enough to print it uh, in a magazine, maybe not a book, but a magazine. So and, and that more, should give you the highest quality. Yeah, and certainly more and more, a lot of the places you submit through, I know Cafe does this, um, it resizes the images for you. Um, it'll actually adjust things if, if they're too large. So it'll actually reduce them to, to meet the uh, requirements that are there. Um, otherwise, as Kale said, Snapseed has some uh, capabilities to do that. Photoshop is probably the easiest, but you're going to be paying a monthly fee uh, for that if, if you get that far. So, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll point out that uh, the NBO call for entry and submission process, um, it will automatically size it down too if it's too large for the, for the Everyone 2022 call for entry and for the um, intertwined, the SAQWA NBO exhibit for that exhibit too, our, our submissions for NBO automatically size down if it's too large. So you can just upload the largest possible there size. Have, right. um, we got a question from Jerry about the corrections. Are they within bounds? Um, you can have, I'm not quite clear on the question, but basically you can have an unlimited amount of corrections. The more corrections you do, I'll stress this again, you take a good photo, 
you put it in the software, whatever software that may be. Now, Snapseed seems to be a popular one. There's hundreds of them. Right. You could pay $10 for one, $5. You could get other free ones. But Snapseed, because it's made by Google, seems to be one of the most popular. You can do unlimited corrections and changes. But the more you do to the image, generally the worse it's going to get. <laughs> It'll start. That's that over-processing. You don't want to over-process. Like when I was demonstrating the brush at the end, all of that was over-processing. Um, all I should have done there is just take out the shadow because everything else looks good. But I just wanted to show you if you have an area where you need a little more green or, you know, there are other things you can do with that brush that are really powerful, but do the least amount possible, um, and I think even though it can have unlimited changes. Where it usually becomes an issue is if the image really stops looking like the piece of work, which I, I, I've never understood why anyone would want to do that. <laughs> Um, but that's that's usually the issue when your work shows up at the exhibit if it's a physical exhibit and it doesn't look like the picture they're going to reject it. Um, so you know as long as it's I think as long as you're keeping true to what's there, um, you're fine. You're, you're going to be fine. And Alan Allison's asking how do you save versions of the photos? And it was that share button at the bottom right, and then save a copy as so you have your original and the copy. You can do that multiple times as you're processing your image at every step if you want. You could save another copy, save another copy. So you have all these different versions. Um, but again, it could get confusing as to wait, which was the best one, which is the original, like Eric was saying. Uh, and again, generally, you want to touch that thing as little as possible. You're probably always going to need a little rotation, one degree here or there. You're going to need a crop. You're going to need uh, possibly a little bit of tuning image and then try to go hands off. <laughs> and I think that ties in a little bit to the, to the last question we had which Michelle was talking about uh, white balance, trouble with colors being true. Um, the first thing I would check is your light. What is the light? It's one reason why uh, to our first point is if you can take it with sunlight, you just can eliminate that. So oftentimes it's the light. Um, you know, if you're just using light from a room, it is changing the color, most definitely. Uh, light is how we see color. Uh, and so certainly if you're going to use a manufactured light, try and get one that approximates the sun uh, or something along those lines or use natural, use, uh, you know, the sun itself through uh, filtered as we described. Um, I would, uh, you know, again, if you're, if you're skilled to, to Kale's comments, he said it many times, you, you can do it post, but I, I just find it so hard to make those minor adjustments. I, I, I would try and get the best photo you can. Um, from the beginning. And I think if the colors aren't reading true, it could be a lot of things. It could be your screen. It could be what you're looking on. You know, every, every screen uh, treats color a little different way. Uh, but I think as long as you're using a good uh, a light source that approximates the sun, um, you should get pretty decent color out of there. Exactly. Yes. Well, any other questions? I don't know. I think we've come to the end of the program. So oh, yeah. I really hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did. Now, Joan and I were texting Joan, our administrative manager during the program, and she goes, now I have to go spend a lot of time figuring out how to do all of this. So I'm sure many of you will want to do the same. Um, I really want to thank Kale and Eric for all their hard work. As you can imagine, to put this presentation together, they spent a lot of time working on it. Um, and I thought the program was terrific. A recording of the program will be available within the week on, you can get to it through the website. It will be on our YouTube channel. You can also donate to help support NBO Presents using the donate tab on our homepage, nationalbasketry.org. Um, and we really hope to see you at Virtually Woven 2022, Crossing Boundaries, that'll be over a three-day period, July 28th to July 30th. There will be more information coming out in the next couple of weeks with all the programs we're doing and the hosts and the panelists and all the other special things we have in store for that weekend. Um, did we get an extra question or two that we wanna look at? We had one more slide to share, and I also wanted to point out to Joan's uh, comments that we're trying to make it actually as simple and easy as possible. Get your piece of butcher paper, set up next to a window and your cell phone, and just go for it. Um, you'll find that it's, it's quite easy 
and uh, we were trying to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, we also wanted to point out, you know, go to nationalbasketry.org, which is an incredible resource for uh, this. Not only this presentation will be on there, but there's a lot of other resources there. If you're not a member, you can click on the Join NBO button to become a member. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, either one of those. If you do the search, you can type this in as the as the address, or you can go to the search on Facebook and Instagram. And just start typing in National Basketry Organization. It'll pop up. And uh, Eric and I also wanted to offer, if you have any other questions that you think of after this presentation, uh, you know, you can shoot us an email, and we're happy to happy to help any way we can and answer any questions we can. And if we don't know the answer, we'll tell you that too. <laughs> but we'll point you to someone who does. Well, I want to thank everybody once again for coming and Kale and Eric, and we are going to, can you pop out of this screen, Kale or Eric, whichever yeah. one of you is controlling that. <laughs> okay, then um, I'm ending the recording and we thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much.